In 2012, both of the girls you see behind me turned six years old. One of them is my daughter, Iman. The other one is Aviel Richman. Aviel's mother, Jennifer, describes Aviel much the way I describe my daughter. Full of life, bouncing brown curls, loves animals, loves people, loves to run barefoot on the beach and play in the sand. Most importantly, really, really empathetic. In 2012, in December, one of these girls was murdered in her school. A deeply troubled young man walked into Sandy Hook Elementary and murdered 26 people, most of them kindergartners. Aviel was one of them. Two days later, the first snow fell in Omaha, and I took this picture of my children. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me that in my life, I had become familiar with the feeling of terror. I had become familiar with the feeling of violence, but in my life. And now, for the first time, I had a feeling of terror for my children. You see, as a teacher and as a mother, I had double the fears now. As a teacher, when a student reached into their backpack once in a while, or their pocket, I was afraid of what they would take out. And now, as a mother, every stranger on the street, every person in a school, every stranger in a mall, gave me that same terror. My instinct was to gather my children under a blanket in my nest in my living room and never leave again. I thought if I can just keep them with me forever, we could be safe forever. But I knew that I had questions to answer. My children asked me why would somebody do that? Why would someone walk into a school and murder six-year-olds? I didn't have an answer for them. But as teachers often do, I turn the question back on them. Why do you think somebody would do something like this? And my son said, when people bully me, I get really mad. I get really, really angry, and I just want to lash out at somebody, at something. I want to hurt somebody. But then, just in time, when someone is kind to me, that feeling goes away. And my daughter took up on that idea and said, what if people had been kinder to the shooter at Sandy Hook? What if people had been nice to him his whole life? Maybe the shooting never would have happened. It's a naive thought, very simple. So I self-medicated with Pinterest, lots of Netflix. <laughs> Ate lots of chocolate. And on Pinterest, I saw an envelope, and it had top secret stamped on it, and it had secret agents' names on it, and it talked about random acts of kindness, and I thought, I can put all these things together, maybe, and present this idea to my juniors at the high school, and say, what if we create a culture of kindness in this school? Maybe then we can prevent another Sandy Hook. So I took the idea to them, thinking, well, they can draw an assignment once in a while if they want to. I can give them a prize for doing so, and they can be on their merry ways, and it'll be fine. They were not okay with this. They said no. You've taught us that if we're going to do something, we have to go all in or nothing at all. So we're going to go all in. We need to concur. And I taught them what concurring meant, so I had to let them do it. <laughs> and so <laughs> they went back and they discussed amongst themselves. They came back. They said, listen, here's how, what it's going to be. We are going to do this as a whole class. And we're going to do it every week. And we're going to do it properly. So I had some sneaky teacher hopes, right? I thought, OK. They're going to feel kind of powerful, but I want them to feel this sense of empathy, to understand how good it feels to be kind to people, to build a habit of kindness, to understand that they, as young as they were, as resourceless as they were monetarily, that they had some power. <coughs> so we became the secret kindness agents. 
We wrote an oath after a lot of talk about the Green Lantern and rhyme scheme and all kinds of interesting things. We wrote an oath. They wrote a set of risks, including my fa face might hurt from smiling too much. People might think I'm a nice person. I might actually become a happier person and I can't be an angsty teen anymore. <laughs> so they had all these risks written. <laughs> and we made a ceremony out of it. But then they said, hold up, we need, we need secret agent names because this is going to be anonymous and we're not asking for rewards because otherwise it wouldn't be kindness. It wouldn't be true kindness, would it? I said, okay. So we decided that we would name each other. We wouldn't give ourselves our own names. So we had a naming day. Years before, at a different school, uh, my students started calling me the beast. And I got really offended because beasts are not necessarily good things. And they said, no, 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 it's a good thing. You're like in beast mode. You're really good at what you do. You're beastie. So I was like, I don't believe you guys. <laughs> so I went on the interwebs and I looked it up and it was indeed true on Urban Dictionary that if you're a beast, you're good at something. So I accepted the name of the beast. Many years later, I went to this new school and the name somehow followed me because children date children from other schools, it turns out. <laughs> and children also accidentally call some of their teachers mom. So my secret agent name became Mama Beast. Remains that way to this day. The agents named each other. We had a naming day and I remember on the naming day, one of our smallest agents came into the room after an orthodontist appointment, so she was late, and she went up to our big Mexican football player who we had just named Biggie. She goes, what should my name be? And I yelled, Smalls, without even thinking about it, Biggie Smalls. <laughs> if you don't know who that is, look it up. <laughs> and Agent Voltic was like, too soon, miss, too soon. So we all had agent names and we created a ceremony and every week at the end of the week I would play some cheesy, cheesy song like We Are the World and they would come up really solemnly and they would get one of the envelopes and they would write down what their random act of kindness was for the week and then we would recite the oath and the risks with whatever hand signal there was. I don't even know how many varieties we had and then we would be on our merry way. You might be wondering what kinds of acts of kindness these were. I had two rules. One, they couldn't cost any money. My students came from very limited resources, some pretty difficult circumstances. So I didn't want them to spend any money, but also I wanted them to understand it doesn't take money to be kind. The other rule was that since we wanted to change the culture of the school, it had to take place within the confines of the school somehow. So the furthest they would go was the road. So we came up with a list of 21 things we could do because there were 21 of us and I made 21 envelopes. And there were things like, you have to smile at everybody you see for an entire week. <laughs> Their faces really did hurt after that. <laughs> you have to pick up litter after school for a half hour every day for a week. You have to write a letter to the custodians explaining why their job is so important and how much you appreciate it. You should send a letter to somebody who may never be told how special they are. There's somebody who kind of falls under the radar. Or send them a birthday card. If they wanted to leave a treat, they could leave a treat. I would provide it for them. Um, they stayed after and cleaned up teachers' rooms without letting them know. Lots of different things. They had to go sit with somebody at lunch that they never sat with, or maybe somebody who was alone. There were just many random acts of kindness. And they were really random. After a while, they started doing things that weren't even in the envelopes. So they would do the envelope one, and then they say, and I did a bonus one. And then they would come back at the end of the week, and they would write a quick journal just for five minutes, describe what happened, how did you feel before it happened, and how did you feel after it happened. And we got lots of different answers. After the ceremony, I started noticing that they were talking to each other about what had happened. It wasn't just, you know, on the sly, let's write down what happened, moving on with class. They started talking to each other about it. They started planning elaborate parts of the ceremony. They started giving me songs to play. And they wanted me to show videos from YouTube about the ripple effect of random acts of kindness. In our discussions, we started talking about bullying, and we started talking about why we were doing this project in the first place. And I remember asking them, raise your hand if you have been bullied. 
and almost everybody raised their hand. And I said, okay, raise your hand if you have been the bully. And almost everybody raised their hand. So I said, well, okay, tell me, how many of you think that you are truly 100% pure and good? You've never done anything wrong. You've never had a hateful thought. Nobody raised their hand. I said, okay, how many of you think you are pure evil? There's nothing good about you. And nobody raised their hand. I said, then what makes you think anybody else is good or bad? And I found a story, a Cherokee legend of a grandfather talking to his grandson. And he said, you know, grandson, inside me there are two wolves and they are fighting each other constantly. One wolf is full of anger and jealousy and spite and greed. The other wolf is full of empathy and compassion and kindness and generosity. And they're always fighting each other. And the grandfather asked him, so which, which wolf wins? And the grandfather said, the one you feed. So we talked about how our project was about learning to feed the good wolf and ignoring the bad wolf, even though he's there all the time. They started doing things like giving their money to people they didn't even know, who nobody else noticed. They were picking up litter from other places other than the school. They were randomly mowing other people's yards without telling them that they were gonna do it or telling them who did it. <laughs> it was really heartwarming to see that they were starting to understand what kindness looked like, what it felt like, and what it was like to experience it. These are only a few of my agents. Agent Cheesy is a skeptic. She's just, nope, nope, this is not gonna work. I don't think so. So she, her first assignment was to send a letter to an administrator who was not the most popular person in the school. And her letter was to tell the administrator, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for, you know, sitting through all of this meanness that you get from students and, and, and parents. And I remember walking down the hallway and handing this letter to that administrator. And it was dark, it was 5.30 in the evening. She just had a really nasty meeting with some angry, angry parents. And her head was in her hands and I gave her the letter. And she read it right away and she said, I really needed to see this today. I have to write a thank you note to whoever wrote this. I said, I can't tell you who it is. It's Agent Cheesy, but I can't tell you who it is. <laughs> and she said, okay, well, I, uh, I, need to, I need to write back, so can you deliver it to whoever this Agent Cheesy might be? Her name's Mac, so Mac and Cheese, that's where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, and, and she wrote the letter and I delivered it to Cheesy. And a year later, I hadn't seen Cheesy for a year, she had a drive-by drop-off of chocolates and a thank you card at my house. And she said that letter that she got back from the administrator changed her whole way of thinking. She wasn't skeptical anymore about kindness. Agent Biggie, our giant Mexican football player, he said that the number one act of kindness that he felt was the most important was mercy and forgiveness. Agent Voltic said it was so much easier now to make friends with people he didn't know because all he had to do was that silly smile. <laughs> And then he would really feel it, and then the person would smile back, and then, oh my goodness, now I have a friend I didn't even mean to make. <laughs> Agent Acat is a refugee from Togo, and her first assignment was picking up litter after school every day, and she cried the whole way through with the first day. She was convinced everybody was laughing at her, that she looked like she was a homeless person, there were all these fears that were happening, she wrote all about it in a journal. By the end of it, big old smiles. She was dragging other people to collect the litter with her, sit with her at lunchtime with the other kids. Agent Smalls gave $25 from her own pocket that she had saved up after working really, really hard and created a ripple effect where nine other people, some of them who didn't even know her, were also giving $25 gifts to people who flew under the radar. Agent Blaze said he just felt warm and fuzzy all the time now, just all the time, just warm and fuzzy. Agent Shy, one of our poets, she signed birthday cards with, from the voice you haven't heard and the face you haven't seen. Agent Scrappy-Doo was the only openly gay male in our school and had been bullied to the point where he, by the time he came to my class, had attempted suicide 14 times as a junior. His head was down and he was, he was beaten. 
By the end of this project, his head was held high, and he was just looking for opportunities to help people. I'm told he does this at work now. He finds the most hated person and is just bound to win them over. <laughs> it's his mission in life. And then, all of a sudden, we became visible. I was on social media, as you know, this is my self-medication. So I was on Facebook, and I was <laughs> writing about how proud I was of my students, and writing about you know, the progress I had seen them make, and, and how wonderful they were. Um, and Cindy Grady, a publisher, said, you know, if you do this as a how-to for other people, we'll publish it at no cost to you. I said, I gotta ask the agents. Of course, the agent said yes. So she came to our class, and she helped us vote for if anybody were to buy this book where the, the proceeds would go to. And the class almost overwhelmingly voted for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. One of our agents, Agent Tris Daug, had been, <laughs> he had been diagnosed with juvenile diabetes just a few months earlier, and his face, I'm sure, hurt really badly from smiling that day. It became a book. People had been messaging me asking, how do I do this project in my family, or in my youth group, or in my book club, or in my school? The book was out, and we started becoming really, really visible. And the school district bought 500 copies of the book for their entire staff. And the opening ceremony of the school, instead of hiring some famous person to come in and speak, um, had us come and had teachers from their own district who exemplified kindness come and speak as a keynote. Here's Agent Shai signing her PE teacher's book. <laughs> Here's Agent Scrappy Doo signing books. Here's Agent Spirit signing books at a tea shop. We became a family. We became braver. We became more loving. We fed our good wolves. They couldn't wait to come to school. They couldn't wait to make somebody's day just by smiling at them. And now, when someone reaches into their pocket or their backpack, I find myself expecting something different to come out. And I no longer feel afraid to let my children out into the world. They, too, have become secret kindness agents. You see up there, Agent Chicken Hero. <laughs> In Swahili, we say, Askari Kuku. And Agent Kitty Hero. And I know that Aviel would feel safe letting her new sister out into the world, who's just weeks old today. And I hope that all of you have been inspired to become secret kindness agents and create teams of your own and feel safe, and feed your good wolves. Thank you.